I did not expect my latest video on hormonal health and PCOS to get as much attention as it did, especially considering the very modest size of my channel. This is why today we're going to be talking about hormones again. Today we're going to be talking about the three main sexual hormones, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, since as women also have testosterone, not just progesterone and estrogen, the female hormones, let's say, males also have estrogen at some levels, although not as high as women do. We're going to be briefly covering the functions of all of those hormones in a woman's body and then I'll talk about some symptoms and possible causes that you might have elevated levels of these sexual hormones. This will give you an idea of whether you should visit your gynecologist and get a prescribed hormonal test if you end up suspecting higher levels than usual. So let's get into it. Hello everyone, my name is Clementina and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I do videos on nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, etc. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in nutrition sciences and a master's degree in food chemistry this year. First off, we are starting with estrogen, which is the one female hormone that everybody has heard about. Your menstrual cycle, if you are not familiar, starts off with the first day that you get your period and ends with the last day of the luteal phase before you get your next period. Estrogen rises as the cycle begins, peaks at ovulation and then starts dropping again towards the luteal phase and towards your next period. The main functions of estrogen in a woman's body consist of regulating her cholesterol levels, also maintaining bone health, but also regulating fertility, menstrual cycles, pregnancy, etc. And later on, the lack of estrogen in one of its three forms is what is responsible for all of the negative symptoms that come with the onset of menopause. Estrogen has three main forms. The first one is estrone, which is the one that both men and women have. It is produced by the fatty tissue, by the ovaries and by the testicles in a man's body obviously. And this is also the form that continues to be present in a woman's body after menopause. Estradiol is the form of estrogen that is most important in females when talking about their ovarian health and is highest when women are still in their childbearing age. So estradiol is very important for your fertility. The third form is called estriol and it is only present in a woman's body when she is pregnant because it is produced by the placenta. This is why when you go and get the hormonal tests, the doctor would then test in your blood not estriol but the other two forms, estrone and estradiol, because you would not have the third form unless you were pregnant. When you hear the term higher estrogen, you could also hear something related to that called estrogen dominance. This is because when talking about estrogen levels, you also need to consider the levels of estrogen and their ratio to the levels of progesterone. And if you have lower progesterone levels, but still the same estrogen levels, that would still be considered estrogen dominance. Estrogen dominance can have a variety of different causes. One of those is obesity, since as I already mentioned, the first form of estrogen is produced also by fatty tissue. And other causes include stress, for instance, because stress is connected to the higher levels of cortisol and cortisol actually can be produced from progesterone and a higher production of cortisol can lead to depleted levels of progesterone which would make the ratio of progesterone and estrogen then imbalanced. Another reason could be excessive alcohol consumption since alcohol consumption can contribute to a decreased ability of the body to break down estrogen. Good health is also very important important for the breakdown of estrogen since an imbalance of the beneficial and non-beneficial gut bacteria can lead to some of these bacteria overproducing estrogen. You have 100% heard of xenoestrogens without knowing what they exactly are. Xenoestrogens are all of the plastics such as bisphenol A and phthalates that can mimic estrogen and this is why they can have a negative impact on one's hormonal health. Xenoestrogens 
deserve a video on their own since there are so many compounds that can be similar to estrogen in its structure but you cannot really oversimplify it and say that they would then increase the production of estrogen or your body's response to the stimulation of the estrogen receptors in the same way that normal estrogen in your blood will do. Some medications can also lead to an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. Health conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome can contribute to the overproduction of estrogen since some ovarian cysts can actually produce estrogen on their own. And lastly, some genetic disorders such as aromatase excess syndrome, aromatase is an enzyme, can contribute to the excessive production of estrogen in one's body. The symptoms of a higher estrogen in a woman's body are quite similar to also the symptoms of higher progesterone. This is why it is very hard, in my opinion, to diagnose whether one has higher estrogen levels than normal, purely based on these symptoms. They include bloating and weight gain, especially around the hips and waist, also fatigue, lower libido as well. One more specific thing would be then the development of ovarian cysts and also fibroids, which can be diagnosed only when you go to the gynecologist. This is why if you do not have any kinds of diagnosed PCOS or ovarian cysts, it would be better to go to the doctor and get a prescribed blood test for these hormones so that you can determine whether you do indeed have higher estrogen levels than normal or not. Now let's talk about progesterone. Progesterone is the hormone that starts rising once you have passed the ovulation phase. That is because progesterone is the hormone that is responsible for basically the successful implantation of an eventually fertilized egg into your uterus so that it can then proceed with the pregnancy. Progesterone starts being secreted from a temporary gland that is formed around the fertilized or non-fertilized egg, depending on whether you're pregnant or not. The excess production of progesterone then leads to the formation of the uterus lining that then sheds off and leads to your period if you end up not being pregnant. In the case that you are pregnant, then the placenta will then form and take over the production of progesterone and this is also one of the conditions in which you would have very abnormally high levels of progesterone abnormally for an individual that's not pregnant obviously your placenta will proceed to produce progesterone and by your third trimester you would have progesterone levels in your body that are 10 times higher than your previous levels of progesterone before you became pregnant and another thing that can influence the progesterone levels in your body are oral contraceptives since they contain the so-called progestin compound which mimics progesterone. Certain kinds of ovarian cysts can also lead to increased levels of progesterone. These cysts are not as harmful as the one that produce estrogen. Ovarian cysts are not all the same and these that produce progesterone are usually called corpus luteum cysts. I am probably mispronouncing that and these ovarian cysts usually go away on their own and they are painless and harmless and do not require any additional treatment. This is why if you happen to get one of those it is not as much of a concern as if you get the other ones that produce estrogen. Again what you're having can only be determined by a gynecologist and also a hormonal blood test. There is also one condition that I'll be mentioning again throughout this video it is called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is actually a group of conditions related to hormonal imbalances and they affect the adrenal glands which are the glands that are on your kidneys and are responsible for the production of certain hormones such as cortisol and also testosterone. It depends on the type of CHA condition that you have but in the case that you get the one that affects your production of progesterone that would mean that that could also lead to an increase in the levels of progesterone. Also certain types of this condition can act in a way that they depend the enzyme that converts progesterone into cortisol and this is the way that you would get higher 
progesterone levels than normal. Symptoms of high progesterone are just as subjective as the ones with estrogen and are very similar. These are all of the basic PMS symptoms. It makes perfect sense since when you're having PMS, premenstrual syndrome, for those of you that do not know this abbreviation, this is also when you have high progesterone levels naturally each month. So that would include fatigue, low energy, low libido, and also bloating, some weight gain, etc. Breast swelling and tenderness, all of these kinds of things that you could be familiar with. And this is again the reason why the most proper way to diagnose this is to go to the doctor and get a blood test. Moving on to the last hormone that we're discussing today, and that is testosterone. Testosterone, although it is the male hormone, is also present in females, and if its ratio in relation to the other hormones in a woman's body is off, then that would lead to a variety of unwanted symptoms in a woman's body. Testosterone is, of course, important for one's health, and we should not be desiring to have abnormally low levels of testosterone testosterone since it's important for instance for us maintaining our muscle mass. This is why the misconception that women can build muscle the same way that men do and that we're going to get huge if we train the same way and eat the same things. This is technically not possible since we do not have the same levels of testosterone and testosterone is required for building and maintaining muscle mass. Possible causes of high testosterone in a woman's body usually include specific conditions. One of those is called hirsutism and it is connected to an imbalance in the production of androgens, so the male, male hormones in one's body. And this condition is usually characterized with an abnormal hair growth in the areas that would be typically characteristic for males, such as the chest, most often the face, also the back. And of course, it is genetically predetermined how much hair you would have on those areas, but it is is the most common way to diagnose one with this condition. A second reason would be the other condition that I already talked about, the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is so hard to pronounce. And since it affects, as I already mentioned, the adrenal glands, in some conditions in this group, that would mean an overproduction of the male hormones, which is again related to most often abnormal hair growth. This is the quickest way to find out if somebody could have this condition or not. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is also strongly associated with an imbalance in these hormones and I talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome in my last video about hormones. Of course, there are a lot of other things associated with this syndrome that are not directly related to the overproduction of androgens. One of those would include infertility, the development of ovarian cysts, also so insulin resistance, obesity, etc. When discussing the symptoms, I already mentioned those a few times. The most common ones are abnormal hair growth, especially on the face, on the back and on the chest. Another common symptom could be androgenetic alopecia. This is male pattern baldness. So you're growing hairs everywhere else except on the head, technically. Other symptoms are quite subjective again, such as changes in mood, low the easiest way to diagnose this would be again through a blood test. You would have to test testosterone levels when they are at their highest, so in the morning because everybody has the same testosterone cycle. During the menstrual cycle, testosterone is only very slightly affected. It rises somewhere around ovulation and then it drops again, but it is very similar throughout the follicular and the luteal phase. It's only at the ovulation time where it actually changes. But in relation to the other two hormones that I discussed, the concentrations are again are much lower as you can see on the graph. A personal note here, if you are a bit hairier than other individuals, that does not 100% mean that you have some hormonal imbalance. I'm mentioning this because I have a personal history with this. I believe that some people are genetically predisposed to grow more hair 
than others and if that does not always correlate with their testosterone concentrations I personally am lucky that I am blonde because I have very large amounts of body hair also on my belly and a little bit on my chest and you know singular hairs around the jawline that you have to pluck out every now and then I don't go to the extreme that I shave them but I have to remind myself to take them out this is why also my gynecologist some years back sent me to do a hormonal test because he noticed at that time because I was not prepared for this examination okay I did not take the preparations and I was hairy as usual and then he sent me to get my male hormones level tested my testosterone levels and there were really no abnormalities I was just with normal testosterone levels and it turns out there was nothing to be done and this is just the way I am also talking about body hair again the ones that make me the most insecure and why he sent me there are the ones that I have on my belly I think it's called a snail trail I saw it on TikTok but you know if you're between the ages of 10 and 14 and you're thinking about shaving it just don't do it because I think this is the reason why it got so much worse I shaved it at one point and then it, it was not the same as before just never do it and you're going to be fine I know you have a little bit but just live with it don't do anything about it because you're going to make it a hundred times worse anyways I hope that now you're a bit more familiar with how hormones work and at least the three main sexual hormones of course there are also other ones that are important for your fertility such as the luteinizing hormone and the follicular stimulating hormone which are very important for ovulation but again these are the three that are most commonly mentioned also in the media and I think that knowing a little bit more about them could really give you some insights into whether you could be having some hormone imbalances or not thank you so much for watching the video if you enjoyed this don't forget to like and subscribe and write down in the comments below if you would like me to do a video on a topic next time i'll be seeing you in my next video